I'm going to be talking about my, uh, my journey from nonprofit journalist to CEO uh, and what I learned along the way about the crazy world of uh, capital and enterprise formation uh, and running a company. Um, and uh, it was a pretty improbable journey. Just how improbable? Well, I don't have an MBA, obviously. Um, not only that, I don't have any business experience at all. And in fact, before I was the CEO of my own company, the last time I had worked as a, the last time I'd worked in a for-profit entity uh, was when I was a bagger at the supermarket uh, in high school. Um, and yet, I did it. I am now the CEO of my own company, which is why I'm standing here on the stage. Spoiler alert. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about where, where I came from and sort of like, because partly what I'm talking about is also sort of turning you know, your craft or your art into a business. And, um, and so I want to start with what that craft and art is. I worked for a long time at This American Life, which is a show on public radio and a podcast. Um, and um, I, uh, while I was there, I learned a lot. I, I developed a deep love for audio as a, as a medium uh, and the power it has uh, to do a lot of very special things that I think other forms of media can't do. And one of the be greatest powers it has, uh, I'm going to play you some examples. I'm going to be playing little clips of sound throughout this talk. But one of the, I think one of the great powers of audio is the power of narrative. Um, and I just want to give you a little example of what I'm talking about here. So, and this is a story that was on This American Life a while ago. And um, it involves an, uh, an actor that maybe some people have heard of named Tate Donovan. Um, Tate Donovan uh, was sort of a character actor, not very well known. People, it's not the kind of actor you recognize on the street. Although for a brief window in the, in the 90s, he had a sort of a recurring role on Friends. Um, and so he all of a sudden was getting recognized. Um, and this was really exciting for him. He was a working actor, he was doing pretty good, but like, it was exciting to be recognized because finally he could be the kind of actor he'd always dreamed of being. That magnanimous, sort of, I'm gonna shake your hand, yes, I'll sign the autograph, absolutely. Um, and, and there was this moment where he got to be that guy, that actor. And it all came to a head one, one night, he was at a Broadway show, uh, and all these people were coming up and recognizing him. I was, ex I, was, I was exactly how I wanted to be. I was doing it, I was doing great. And then the kid with the camera came along. <laughs> This nervous kid, I don't know, he must have been 16 years old. He's in a rented tuxedo, unbelievably like shy and awkward, and he's got like acne, and he's got a camera in his hand. And underneath the marquee is his date, who is literally like a, a prom dress, and she's got a corsage, and she's really, you know, nervous and sort of clutching her hands. And he sort of comes up to me and he sort of mumbles, you know, something like, you know, something about a picture. And I'm like, oh, I just feel for him. So I'm like, oh, absolutely, my gosh, sure. I have no problem, my God, you poor thing. And, and I go up to his, to his girlfriend, I wrap my arms around her, and I'm like, hey, where are you from? Fantastic guy, going to see the play, that's great. And the guy is sort of not taking the photograph very quickly. He's just sort of staring at me, and he's got his camera in his hands, and it's down by his, like, chin, you know? And, and uh, she's very stiff and awkward, and... I, you know, I don't know what to do, so I just lean across and I, I kiss her on the cheek. And I'm like, all right, come on, take the picture, hurry up. And finally he sort of like snaps it. And uh, I'm like, okay, it was really wonderful to meet you. And he just like st stammered over to me and was like, um, could you take a picture of us? Oh. And the whole time he just wanted me to take a picture of him and his girlfriend underneath the awning of the play. He didn't want to picture me. He had no idea who I was. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing, the power of narrative. Uh, but the other, another great power of audio, um, there was a study done uh, where they did, uh, it was a study about like, the ability, uh, how, how easy it is to lie through, through the media. And uh, they, researchers made up a fake story and they had it, and they put it on the TV news. They, they wrote a fake article about it. They did a fake news report about it, and they did a fake radio story about it. And then they asked people how, who, um, and then they asked people to determine whether it was a lie or not. And the people listening on the radio had the easiest time determining the lie. In other words, 
radio is the, audio is the hardest medium to lie through. Um, and I think that's because all you have is, it's, uh, it, it is, you, you form, when you're, when you're listening to audio, you sort of create a connection with the voice. You don't have a picture, you don't have any of these implicit biases that we're talking about uh, before. You just connect with the voice and you create the picture around that voice. And often the pictures that we create look more like us and so we feel more empathy with the voice that we're hearing. Um, and, uh, and there's a more authentic connection so it's harder to lie through. So authenticity is this amazing power of audio. So um, this is a piece of tape that we, that, that, uh, we were, um, that, I, that I had at This American Life. Um, it was a story that we'd done in This American Life. It was a guy named Dave Ramsey. Um, and Dave Ramsey has a radio uh, show. Do anybody know who Dave Ramsey is? Yeah. So Dave Ramsey is like, he's like a, this sort of money guy. He does these, um, he hosts this call-in show. People talk, talk to him and, and um, <laughs> And they come up with their, their money problems. But it also sort of, and so he talks about getting out of debt and all that sort of stuff. But it's also sort of like a little bit of a community. And, uh, and he ends up giving sort of more than financial advice. And that's what this clip is. We're going to start this segment off with Carrie in Kankakee, Illinois, WKAN 1320. Hi, Carrie. How are you? Hi. How are you? Good. How can I help? All right. So Carrie is calling into the Dave Ramsey Show. And this is the clip of the Dave Ramsey show that appeared on the radio show This American Life. Uh, and, uh, and her problem is that she is living with this, her problem is her boyfriend. She's living with the boyfriend. She has a very, very low paying job. He has a high, higher paying job. And things aren't good. The thing is, um, he's like very, to a point, controlling. We share expenses. I have to give up half of my paycheck to pay for the bills, mm -hmm. to help pay for the bills. When I'm done doing that, then I have hardly any money left to do for my kids or for myself or to try and put money back. Mm -hmm. Okay, he says that I can't leave because I would never be able to make it on my own. Mm -hmm. I will admit I'm not very good at handling money. I don't know how. Mm -hmm. well, let, me, let me ask you something. If, okay. if you were sitting down with a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. how, how, how old are you? I'm 41. Okay. If you were to sit down over a cup of coffee with a a 27-year-old mm -hmm. single young lady that was living with a guy, mm -hmm. and she told you what you just told me, what would you tell her? To get out, you can make it on your own. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Okay, but where? Did, how do I start on my income? I mean... Well, I'm not positive. You don't make a lot of money. I agree with that. Right. But let me tell you what. You're in a really unhealthy relationship mm -hmm. you're dealing with a guy who um he's not hitting you is he no you sure yeah i'm not sure i believe you yeah it's fine i'm sorry it's okay i just i need to you got to get out of there girl you got to get out of there now Okay. He, he says, you know, that it's me. It's because no, it's not you, darling. This guy's sick. Okay. You've got to get away from him. Okay. Okay. And you and think I can survive? Well, I can tell you this. If nothing else, you can start by going to a domestic violence shelter right now mm -hmm. and checking in with your kids, and they will help you. And, and you know, you may have to take a part-time job. Um, you may have to move into subsidized housing. Mm -hmm. of some kind. I don't know exactly what the short term the next six months is going to look like, but mm -hmm. I can tell you this. Carrie, you were not designed by God for this man. Okay. Um, that clip, obviously, is very... You feel something very real happening in that exchange, and you feel it. Dave Ramsey felt it. You can hear the honesty when she finally, you can hear that she's not being entirely forthcoming, and then when she finally admits it, you hear the change in her voice. You hear all these things that I don't know if you would have detected necessarily if it were video and certainly not in print. It's just harder to render those things. And because we are creating our own picture of, I, I'm sure if I went around the room and asked, what does that collar look like? Every single person would have a different, different description of her. Um, but because, and because we're creating that picture in our minds, we, she's ours in a certain way, and we connect with her. Um, and that is, a, I think, one of the greatest powers of audio is the, the, the ability to sort of help people empathize. Um, 
So you have this power of narrative, you have this power of empathy, and that can sort of combine in this wonderful way to, to help increase understanding uh, in a way that, like, where, where you feel something on, a, on an emotional level. Um, and that's this last clip I'm going to play. This was a, um, this was a, back during the housing crisis, we decided to do a show about, like, what was going on with the economy. And uh, I, we were, we, we, it was a show called The Giant Pool of Money, and it ended up, um, we found a guy who had been sort of affected by the housing crisis. He had taken out um, a very large, he he'd had a couple part-time jobs. He made about $45,000 a year, and yet he had, the bank had given him a very, very large home loan. Call it 540 for round figures. You basically borrowed $540,000 from the bank, and they didn't check your income. Right. It's a no-income verification loan. They don't call me up and say, you know, how much money? They don't do that. I mean, it's, it's almost like you pass a guy in the street and you say, you lend me $540,000? He said, well, what do you do? I got a job. Okay. I mean, it, 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 it seems as if it's that casual, even though there are a lot of papers that get filled out and stuff flies all over with the faxes and the emails and all like that. Essentially, um, that's the process. Would, would, would you have loaned you the money? I wouldn't have loaned me the money, and um, nobody that I know would have loaned me the money. I mean, I know guys who are criminals that wouldn't lend me that money, and they'd break your kneecap. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't know why the bank did it. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I mean, $540,000, a person with bad credit. So that was that clip began the show that we did on the mortgage on the mortgage crisis, which was essentially asking asking and answering Clarence's question: Why did the bank lend him and many, many, many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people like him lots large sums of money that they probably wouldn't pay back? And that so that and that became sort of a hit, and that led to um, the show that we did called Planet Money. And so we, we realized like, oh, you can take these tools that we've learned that I've used. I thought you could just. I thought you could just use on a show like This American Life, sort of a storytelling show, but you can actually apply them to really tough financial concepts. So we did Planet Money for five years. And during Planet Money, I realized like, okay, so This American Life worked, Planet Money started developing this large audience. And then I was like, wait, I think there's a business here. Um, and we did, a, uh, we, did a, we did this project at Planet Money where we uh, went around the world and we, we talked to all the people who were involved in making a t-shirt. And we actually made that t-shirt and then we told our listeners that we were going to, you know, you could buy the T-shirt that we were going to be documenting the making of. Um, and we thought, like, you know, a couple, maybe, I don't know, a couple thousand people would maybe buy the T-shirt. Uh, and we ended up selling uh, 25,000 T-shirts and uh, at 25 bucks a pop, which was almost $600,000. And I was like, that is some really interesting audience engagement. It feels like there's something here. So after mulling it over for a long time, I decided, okay, I think there's a business here. Um, and I set out on my own to launch it. Um, and I put together this deck, and I was sort of talking to people about, like, you know, look, I've done this show and this show, and they're at the top of iTunes, so give me money, and I'm going to make more shows. Uh, I was telling people, like, look, there's the, you know, podcasts are coming to the dashboard. Um, you know, I thought I had a pretty sweet, sweet deck. Um, and then, um, but once I actually started going out and pounding the pavement and trying to raise money, uh, it was much more difficult than I thought. And that made me realize, like, wait a minute, there's a, in the creating of the business, I'm going to go backwards, there's an actual story. So I started recording my conversations with investors that I was trying to raise money from, and I put it into a podcast called Startup, and it also w went, went very well, but I'm going to play a couple clips from that. So, so, and the very first episode featured my disastrous attempt to pitch uh, Chris Saka, a venture capitalist in, in California. Anybody familiar with Chris Saka? Um, yeah. So um, this is me. I, I get together, and I'm like making my pitch, and I, I put it. And basically, he, he met, we met in a sushi restaurant. He got me out. I thought we were going to be in some boardroom. And he was like, no, let's go out on the street and make, me, make, make your pitch there. And I didn't have my laptop with me. And so I'm sort of stammering through everything. Um, and this is just a sample section from the pitch. You got to tighten up your story. So the, We'll start again. Yeah. So you've now kind of All meandered. Right really tight this time how you're gonna make money doing this so you you make money a combination so there's three major 
There's three major revenues stream. I start again. I meander my way through the ad rates, planet money. At a certain point, I find myself deep into an explanation of my friend's successful Kickstarter project. Chris interrupted. You lost and track of your own outline. Yeah, I did. What you, what you haven't given me is the outline of your story, right? Uh -huh. If I were calling an Uber right now and it said, it's going to be here in two minutes, and that was all the time you had, uh -huh. what are you doing? So I'm making a network of digital podcasts uh, that we will monitor, that, that, will, that, will, that is going to meet. <laughs> Sorry. At a certain point in the pitch, he just stopped me and he was like, all right, here's how you give your pitch. And he gave me my pitch back to me. Uh, um, but that, so, so I did, I put out that podcast and actually, you know, that was like, I, you know, it became like, I was like, oh, this is a really interesting world. Nobody's gone inside this. And so we continued to do the, these podcasts and we did, you know, two episodes, three episodes. I thought I would maybe do four to six episodes, but they kept on going. Um, and we, and I started doing Podca you know, podcast about all different phases of building this business. And it was like sort of me bumbling my way through this thing. But in bearing these sort of like these, uh, what I realized as I was like put putting this out there, I got all these emails from people and tweets and stuff. And it was like, oh my God, I had the exact same thing happen to me. And I realized that the story that you tell is that like, yeah, you're killing it all the time. But deep inside, every single person who has ever tried to start a business, I'm sure has had a pitch like that, if not worse. Um, and has gone through these things. So then we started like, and so we did a whole episode on naming, for example. And we couldn't come up with a name of our company. And uh, I had the American Podcasting Corporation, which I really liked, APC. Uh, but my, my co-founder hated it. Uh, and then we kept on getting these things like destroyed by, the, by trademark law. And then finally, one night, we were at my, um, we were at my co-founder's house and we were sort of like gone on, we went on this foreign language kick and that sort of led us into the Esperanto dictionary and we're like that's it we'll name our company an Esperanto word and so I have a, I recorded us having that conversation and then I came home and uh, I told my wife that we come up with a name Orello 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 what is that what is that supposed to mean? Well, it's, uh, it's ear in Esperanto. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's so dumb. That's so dumb. So dumb, it's good though, right? <laughs> what? Whose idea was that? It came up organically. How does that come up organically? I was like... Speaking Esperanto? <laughs> um, all right. So, you get the idea. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm just going to speed ahead here. I badly miscalculated how long this would take. So, uh, so anyway, it worked. What, the weird thing that happened is that like, telling a story about your own futility at fundraising actually makes people want to invest in your company. Uh, we ended up raising $1.5 million. And uh, we have uh, now two shows that are up and running. We just launched uh, the trailer for our third show that comes up. Um, and where we are now is uh, we have two shows launched, a third on the way. We're, we're, we're about total audience of about half a million people. Um, and we're actually making money. There is actually, you know, you get money. The ads are, are doing pretty well in, in podcasting. Uh, we have 15 employees. Um, but we've continued to sort of do the, the startup podcast. We, we continue to do it about our company, and then we just launched a season two about another company. I think we're going to try to make this into a franchise of sort of like documenting startups in the process of going through the thing. But the, the, piece of, the last piece of tape I wanted to play for you is from uh, a more recent episode of Startup, which was actually after our company was, was launched. Um, and we've been up and running, and our second show, Reply All, was up and running. And it was a shit show, like it always is. Uh, in the early days of a startup. We didn't have enough people. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, everybody was running around like we were being very, very inefficient. And we're trying to get out these podcasts. Um, and there was like some very, very light, late nights on the reply all uh, for everybody. And uh, PJ, um, and, and then uh, and we decided to sort of document what was happening the week where we had this sort of horrible 
late night things were things kept on breaking and not working and then stories ended up being not that good and we would do edits and they wouldn't work and then we'd have to reconfigure everything and it still wouldn't work and PJ the host of Reply All ended up being at the office until 4 in the morning and then he was there till midnight on New Year's Eve and then he was there till like 2 in the morning on Christmas Eve it was just crazy uh, and so we decided to document it and then talk about what happened and in the documenting of that I learned something I think a very valuable lesson I want to share for other people. Um, so I'm going to play two little pieces of tape. First, um, so this is just sort of like PJ sort of talking about the, the week. You know, I have a weird rash on my foot that I need to see a doctor about. <laughs> and I think I have gingivitis, but I can't see my dentist. So I'm just like, I, I don't know, I have like mouthwash at work now because I have this like anxiety that I'm getting really bad, like weird mouth rot because I can't see a dentist. Um, I'm out of laundry. And I think if I don't wear clean socks, the weird things going on with my foot is going to get worse. <laughs> like, I keep thinking I'm going to have a stroke. I had a friend who was like a manager of a bunch of American apparels, and she was like 23, and she had a stroke. And I was like, how, do you, how does that happen? And she's like, I was under an insane amount of stress, and like a 23-year-old shouldn't be managing a bunch of stores. And it could just happen. And I keep wondering, like, was this how she was feeling? And could she possibly have been feeling worse than this? Like, I wanted to call her. What do you, what do you think should be done? We need another Alex. Like, the, the, it's weird, because, like, like, he's genuinely my hero. And I'm kind of like, what the fuck, man, a little bit this week. That's me. I'm Alex, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... That was, that was really weird to hear, you know, as, as, uh, you know, as a CEO. And you're like, I'm also obviously working my ass off. And, um, and, you know, so lesson one, hard work isn't enough, right? You have to be sort of giving your employees a reason and a, and a glimmer of hope that things are going to change and that there's a reason for them doing this. But then, so I came back and I tried to address it. And then there, this is the moment that like really resonates with, with me and I think about all the time and hopefully it will help you. So Lisa Chow is one of our uh, reporters and she was sort of like interviewing me about what was going on. It got all very meta. But uh, at a, at a per certain point she asked me this, she told me this, this, this thing on tape. PJ said, we need another Alex. And so the other day when you were talking to PJ, you're like, we're not going to get another Alex. And, and there's also no conversation about potentially hiring more producers for their show. Um, did I, I said that we're not going to get another me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny to hear you say that because that comment you had forgotten, it was on tape. We had recorded it the day before. We're not going to get another me. Um, unless you know of one. I had totally forgotten I'd said that. And, in, and, and I, I hadn't forgotten I'd said it. I didn't understand that that's what I had said. In my mind, I had said, absolutely, we need to staff up, we need more resources, we need to do all these things, I'm with you, it's not gonna happen right away, I gotta figure it all out. But, what I'd say, but I, my employee did not hear that. He heard a whole different thing. And that was just such a powerful, powerful realization is that, and you know, when, before you're a CEO, like what you say doesn't really matter. People aren't really listening to you that much. <laughs> and all of a sudden, <laughs> and you sort of become comfortable with that, especially if you've been living with that reality for 45 years. So, uh, and then all of a sudden I'm in this place where like people are really paying attention to what I'm saying. It was a very, very powerful lesson. Um, and it was a powerful lesson of sort of like, um, uh, the, again, the power of recording. Recording what's going on in your office is not a bad, is not a bad thing to do. I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm.